Good morning. All right. It's so wonderful to see everybody on this date that I thought would be a little bit warm, but at least the sun came out. My name is Xavier Mitchell. I'm the senior HR and diversity business partner here at Provident Bank. I'm excited to partner with Provident Women to be a moderator for this panel. Um, I'd like to take some time to let the panelists introduce themselves and give a little uh, elevator pitch about what they do, and then we can jump into our questions. So, can you want to get started? Very good morning. I'm sorry if I'm, this is uh, just this mic is <laughs> it's projected. Um, it is so nice to be here among all of you outstanding women. It's funny when I looked around the room, there were so many of you that I kind of recognized, maybe from other stories that I've done over the years in journalism, especially you to the left of me. She said you interviewed me once before during COVID. It's so nice to meet all of you. You have so much that you all bring to the table. I'm honored to be a part of this panel, and I'm sure we'll take a deeper dive into you know, our background a little later. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ferlanda Nixon, and I, am, I have two roles. I am the Chief of Policy and External Affairs for the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey, but I'm also an entrepreneur. And so, do you want me to do more or just to say hello? Um, good morning, everyone. I don't know if you can hear. Oh, there we go. Hi, my name is Erica Lassan, and I am a joy strategist and the founder of Journey to Purpose, J O Y R N E Y. And as a joy strategist, I help organizations learn how they can maximize engagement in their team by increasing their productivity through well-being for women and caregivers. But on a personal level and an individual level, I help entrepreneurial women, caregivers, especially moms, learn how they can create more time, energy, and space for joy in their life and career. One feel good they have time. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Janaba Johnson-Jones. I am a former corporate employee. I was a marketer turned entrepreneur. I'm the founder of Hudson Kitchen. It, we are a food business incubator based in Kearney, New Jersey. And um, I help small business, small food businesses um, start and grow and become profitable. Thank you for that introduction. So can you all talk a little bit about how you got started in entrepreneurship and what has been the biggest lesson that you've learned through your journey? Sure, would you like me to get started? Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if I actually introduced myself, which mm -hmm. is the purpose of the first question. So really Kravitz, I'm a New Jersey-based journalist. So what is a journalist? It could mean print, it could mean radio, it could mean TV. I kind of do a little bit of it all. So I got my start uh, when I was in the baby carriage. My parents swear to God that I was in the baby carriage asking everybody questions. Where's your husband? What do you do for a living? I'm a curious cat. It's always been in me. It's my nature. Um, went to school for journalism, learned every bit about the business. And I found my way in this, like, it's a very, even though you're working for a company, right now I'm working with News 12, you're working for a large company, somewhat to Provident Bank, but I'm an entrepreneur as a person. So I started my own company, and it's a very difficult thing to do on learning, to kind of go outside on your own, make your own schedule, do the bookkeeping, book yourself for events like this. It's tough, but I'm here to explain my path and you know how I got started with it. But it's certainly not easy, but it's, uh, it's something that I crave. I love it so much. So I'm going to try again with this mic. Uh, so I started my professional career as an attorney. I practiced law for 18 years, five years at a law firm in Manhattan, and then 13 years at a uh, in-house at a corporation and rose through the ranks and became general counsel of um, several of their operating units. I started being an entrepreneur on a part-time basis. I, had, I started my side gig, as it, we often describe it where I started coaching women because when I was at the corporation, a lot of people asked me, you know, how did I get from point A to point B to point C? I was continually getting promoted and recognized um, and I was giving, started giving people advice and they would come back to me and say, you know that advice you gave me? It actually really worked. So then a light bulb went out, off in my head and I said, you know, probably get paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how I started my, my side gig, 
and then I left corporate America and it became what I did for a, for a living uh, as an entrepreneur. So I, I describe myself as a leadership consultant and I do executive coaching, career coaching, and college coaching. And I do uh, workshop develop, uh, professional development workshops. And I also provide leadership for organizations in need of uh, leadership, usually small nonprofits. And that was all before I actually got my full-time gig. So what I do for the African American Chamber of Commerce is what I do full-time. So now I'm back to being a leadership consultant as a sidekick. <laughs> um, well, to answer the question, I think I didn't necessarily choose entrepreneurship. I think it chose me. I think I was always meant to be an entrepreneur. Um, I love the idea of utilizing your gifts and your joy uh, to not only make yourself better, but serve others. And the moment I began to realize that I could do this for a living, it was over. <laughs> um, but there were really three pivotal points that kind of uh, created this uh, desire to commit to full-time entrepreneur. Uh, the first one being when I graduated from college during the recession in 09, I could not find a job for the life of me. And it really started to wear on my self-esteem, my confidence, um, my self-worth, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I was depressed. I was crying every day. I was um, miserable. I hated going to the space where I spent my working hours. And at one point, um, I called my then boyfriend, he's now my husband, and this is the part of the reason why, this is amazing. But um, I would call him every day on my lunch break crying. <laughs> and he asked me one of the times, well, Erica, what is it that you wanna do? And I told him, well, I wanna do, like, I wanna be creative, I wanna be inspired, I don't want cooler conversations. And he said, well, start somewhere. And I was like, wow, what an idea. Um, and that's exactly what I did. A week later, I quit where I was uh, working, which was my college internship. They didn't value me, you know? And I think that that really made me want to do something different. And from there, I started um, working retail, but very intentionally. And while I was in that space, I started making jewelry again because I started off as a jewelry designer. Um, I got into on-air hosting. I did that for seven years and built a whole career out of it. And then um, uh, when I had a really big break that I thought was going to be on TV screens across the country, I found out a week later that I was pregnant. And so that really um, forced me to consider, well, what is it that you want to do long term? And then from there, that led me to um, figuring out how I could do the things that I enjoy, maximize my time, be there for my family, but also contribute to the world in an engaging and empowering way. And so, here we are. Um, I started my business after a layoff. So I worked um, at Condé Nast, I worked at W Magazine, I was the digital brand development director there. And they laid me off on October, October 28, 2014. And um, I told my, my mom, told my husband, I don't want to go back to work with someone else. I'm going to start a business. And I really loved fitness, so I went and got a personal trainer certification. And the goal was to start this fitness business. And a friend of mine came to me and said, well, you're going to tell me how to work out. What do I eat? And I was like, oh, well, that's easy. So I went and found a chef. And we, we started creating recipes. And we started looking for a kitchen to make our food and couldn't find one. So I kind of went on this journey of um, wanting to build my own kitchen first to use it for myself and my own business and then rent out to other people. And I finally just abandoned that, that business altogether and went all in on Hudson Kitchen. So um, we ended up opening in 2019, 8,000 square foot facility that, um, that offers a food business as a place to uh, make their food and deliver it out to their customers. Erica, you touched on something that I thought was really important. Um, about support, right? And making sure you have that support and getting feedback. So asking for support might be viewed as a weakness. How did you create a village of supporters? And that goes to all of the panelists. Um, I really like to think of it in a way where for, we're not, no one's meant to do anything alone. And I think the moment we begin to understand that, we begin to recognize the abundance that is around us, not only in our uh, support circle, but in resources and tools and ideas. Um, but to answer your question, I began to start my Vibe Tribe, that's what I call my support circle, um, with my friends and family, very, very early on, mainly my family. 
So that started with my uh, husband, now my husband, but also my siblings. My siblings are amazing. Oh my gosh, I love them so much. I'm not gonna ramble and rant about how awesome they are, but um, my parents just, really beginning to communicate with them uh, what it was that I wanted to do. And even though they didn't completely understand it, I think what's most important is that when you are clear on what your vision is, that you really hold on to it with conviction and that you speak it um, often. Because even if you don't necessarily understand what support looks like, you'll begin to find that you will begin to get clearer the more you say the things out loud. And you'll also begin to attract the support that is required in that given season. So I, I think that by simply stating what the vision is, stating what your goals and your dreams are, you'll begin to curate your vibe tribe along the way. And I'm telling you, there have been times where I've met strangers on the street that have become like people in my vibe tribe that I communicate with often or who have led me to opportunities uh, and jobs when I really, really needed it and I wasn't sure of what I was gonna do next. So um, the vibe tribe is all around, the support is all around, but first and foremost, we need to get clear on what it is that we as entrepreneurs want, what we need and being honest with ourselves about it. Um, and then we'll begin to find the help that we need along the way. I was gonna say, I could wholeheartedly agree with everything you just said, but I was gonna say um, that I think that you mentioned certain words about like getting started and moving forward. It's almost like taking that first step, really kind of, because you can't figure out to get that clarity without taking the first step. So it's like taking the first step and just taking action along the way, and again, telling people what you wanna do and how you wanna do it is really important. Cool. So I don't want to repeat what's been said. Uh, I do, I strongly feel that your family is going to be your strongest support network. And I think Erica did a great job explaining that. But what I did want to share with you, when you're in the right space, the support comes to you. Uh, people kind of reaffirm the decision that you're making. And so for me, being, first of all, out the gate, I didn't call myself a leadership consultant. I didn't start to call myself that until five years into the game. All I knew was I was advising people on how to make their careers go better, um, either for getting promotions or just dealing with situations in the workplace. Uh, but. I found that people just kept coming to me and asking me for advice and asking me to do certain things and can you do this? And as I shared with others, when you're an entrepreneur, you eat what you kill. So when people would come to me and say, can you do? I would say to myself, I must look like I can do whatever it is they ask me to do. So I'm just gonna say, yes I can and then I will figure it out. And so that's when your support group comes in because then you sit down and you have to say to yourself, who do I know who can help me do what I was just asked to do? And so that's how my support group grew. Sure, I, um, one thing that I, I, I think all of us, we have some common ground here, even though we're in completely different spaces, different industries, but one thing besides my family who are just unbelievably so supportive, um, something about my field that I'm not sure if people are aware of, most young journalists have to uproot themselves. They go to college, they are coddled there, they are, you, are, you have your hand being held. The next step is for you to lead and get that first job in East Bumble. You're supposed to take a, a job for 30 grand, maybe less. You're supposed to start out, you're gonna provide for yourself, find a home, you're gonna be away from your friends that you've made in college, you're gonna be away from your family. And something turned out in the connections I've made at Monmouth, where I went to school, they provided a startup TV station out of everywhere. Here in New Jersey, we don't have New Jersey TV stations other than News 12. We are overshadowed by the New York and Philly stations. So right place, right time, my biggest support system was the people that hired me that first startup job. They hired me as a promotions assistant. I didn't work one day of promotions. Not one day, it was immediately we're throwing Kimberly into the fire, producing a show. Then I became executive producer of the show. Then I was including myself in the show as a contributor. 
It's that support system that believed in me and took a chance on a college graduate. And this is kind of what led me fast forward 12 years later into the position I'm in. And that is why I feel I'm able to kind of give back to the community, pay it forward to those young journalists that are just starting out. Thank you. So you talked about being thrown into the fire, right? And time management is a, a big component of that. Poor time management is an important part of operating a business. Can you share an example of a time when you manage your time really well and it resulted in a big win for your business? And I'm gonna start with you, Janana. Um, I had a really hard time with time management um, just because I came from a corporate environment. And the environment that I came in, came from was you had to like immediately answer every email and answer every phone call and everything. So it was a matter of me like taking the time to step back and say, okay, I don't have to answer this email right now, and I can kind of prioritize my own time. So I'll be really honest, I'm just now getting to the point where I'm prioritizing my time the way that I ought to be. So I'm not sure I can answer that quick question. Um, but one thing that does help me is like getting focused and kind of going all in. Um, last year I won a $100,000 grant for my business, and I spent, um, you have to do a business plan. Thank you. <laughs> A business plan and I took um, my business my old business plan that I used um, when I was starting the business and I spent an entire week didn't do anything else didn't answer phone calls didn't do anything else and finish that plan in order to submit it for that contest and I won the money so that was fun. Um, I love this question because it's all about creating time energy and space for joy right but I will say that time management for me was not great growing up. I am first generation American. Um, there's CPT and then there's African time. Uh, and growing up, my family ran on African time. But uh, having children was a game changer for me. At, once I had my first kid, I did not have time to waste. So a lot of the things that I would entertain before children, I really had to get discerning about. And if it didn't bring me joy, I didn't want to do it. And I got very clear on what my priorities were. I got very clear, again, on what my vision was. And I began to really um, get rid of the things, release the things that didn't serve that vision or the things that brought me joy. And not only did my life get better, right, in terms of how I began to manage my time, my relationships also improved because then I didn't feel as drained and overwhelmed. Um, my business began to grow because then I was only focusing on the things that I was super excited about and working with the people that I was super excited about. And it also just lit, left space for me to really dream bigger and focus on the things that um, not only would help and serve me, but serve the work that I was doing with others. So um, I actually created a planner. I love time and time measuring so much. I created a planner um, to help others understand the value of really prioritizing their joy so that you can buy your time back. Um, and I think that when you're clear on what brings you joy, it just makes it a lot easier to manage time management. And so that for me was a win, just getting a grip on my time and knowing that I could use it to serve my dreams, my joy, and other people around me. So I'm going to, again, try to uh, approach this from a different perspective. So when I started uh, becoming an entrepreneur on a full-time basis. I literally had just left corporate America, let's say on a Wednesday, and started to expand my business um, on a full-time basis on Thursday. And what I didn't, well, so now I feel like I have all the time in the world, right? It's, I don't have to answer to anyone but myself. And my issue with time management was because I was saying yes to everything because I thought I had so much time, I realized, so in corporate America, you know, there's only a, 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 a finite small bit of time that you're actually working. There's a lot of downtime in, in corporate America when you're in the office. So when I was an entrepreneur, I was like, wait a second, I'm totally and completely overlooking myself. Uh, I'm putting myself in Manhattan and then saying, you know, Three hours later, I can be in New Jersey, and then I can do something in the evening. I totally overlooked myself. And the only way that I found to manage my time was I literally had to schedule every single thing. I literally had to put it in a calendar. 
And I knew every single thing. So I had to factor in when I was waking up and when I was going to sleep and when I was going to have lunch in order to ensure that I was not overbooking myself. And similar to what Erica said, because you're an entrepreneur and because you do have a heightened level of anxiety because you are eating what you kill, you do have to also schedule that uh, self-help time as well. That's very important that you uh, schedule time for your own mental sanity and for your time to socialize and engage with other people because for many of us, when we start off as an entrepreneur, we're doing it as a solopreneur, we're, it's by, we're by ourselves. And so that social engagement is also very important and you have to schedule that as well. Well, I'm gonna have to rip a page out of every book here because I need to learn all of the time management tips. I don't have children yet, I am planning a wedding, so this requires a lot. That's new. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to point out, because when you said about corporate America, when I worked at my last station, it was Me TV. I love Lucy, Mass Chips, you may have remembered the, that channel. I worked there and produced their news for eight years, but then they sold, they sold the station. So I'm like, what am I gonna do? It's the start of the new year, back in 2021, and I'm crushed. So, actually it was 2022, we're in, in 23. So they sold their station, and I'm like, well, I guess I gotta find a new full-time gig. Right, and where, where am I gonna find a full-time job in TV you know, in a month? So that's when I decided that I think that the entrepreneur in me came out and I said, I'm gonna work for myself and I'm gonna manage my time and I'm gonna find myself my gigs. And that's when News 12 fell into my lap and that's like a big client of mine now. Now, I didn't mention something earlier. It's kind of like my private life side gig. I've been running an e-commerce business for six years and it is the most fun I enjoy it so much because I don't have to engage with anybody. I don't have to talk to anybody, it's my time. So it's fun because I'm able to buy and sell. I go out to the estate sales, the antique sales, yard sales, and I flip. And that profit that I make on the side is basically for fun, you know? And I enjoyed it, it's my mental health moment because that's something that I don't think we've talked about yet. Whatever job, whatever space you're in, the mental health, I mean, the shoulders get tense. I mean, I'm covering fires, I'm covering homicides. That's not what I'm cut out to do all the time. When do I have time for me? So that is something that I've locked into my scheduling and into my relationship. We have a calendar, it's called the Time App. Time Tree App, very good, very helpful. Locking out your time to make sure that you have some you time and that way you're not suffering where your friends, your family, your relationships, it, you could really all do it all, but with it. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, Ferlanda, you talked about eating what you kill. As an entrepreneur, cash flow is not something that's always con consistent. What techniques can you share to ensure that you have cash flow in good and bad times? So I often tell people what my definition of an entrepreneur is because again, my brain thinks differently from other people, and so I have my own definition. So my definition is, an entrepreneur is a person who has multiple streams of income. And that is how you ensure that you have cash flow, because you have to have money coming in from a lot of different places. So for me, at one point in time, I had commercial real estate that was revenue generating, I had residential real estate, that was revenue generating. I had my consulting practice that was revenue generating. I had, what else did I have? Mm -hmm. Oh, so I was, I was teaching, adjunct teaching at uh, Rutgers University, and I also did do a part-time um, communications work for Rutgers as well. And so in my head, I had that uh, amount of money that I had to make monthly and annually, and as long as I was hitting it on any one of those five, um, I guess, pillars, then I was good. So the best I can tell you is to diversify your revenue stream. And if you have to do 1099, which is what you'll do as a consultant, as an independent contractor, you do that. But if you can also get a part-time W-2 uh, position, that grants you flexibility. You can do it that way as well. So that, my answer is multiple streams of income. 
Um, my answer is a little bit different. I'm all about focus. So we at Hudson Kitchen, we sell two things. We sell kitchen memberships and we sell courses and education, and that's it. Because I, for me, the focus is where I thrive. It's just, it just works. It just works better for me. I love this question because I'm still trying to figure all that out too, right? But uh, if I'm just being completely honest, but I do think that uh, I can take from both of what you've said. Um, at one point, I, as a multi-passionate creative, I was doing a lot of different things, like so many different things. But personally, after a while, I found that it was overwhelming for me, especially having young children. So the moment I began to focus and dial in on the things that bring me joy, um, and the ways in which they contribute to the work that I do, getting clear on which ones were revenue generating from the things that I was doing. It then made it a lot easier for me to um, focus on those things and understand how I could build out on them. And that was really helpful for me because then I began to better understand my client and the ways that I could serve them in each part of their journey. So then I began to create basically vertical, vertical integration. I figured out different ways that I could serve them at the different areas. And so yes, I'm bringing in different revenue streams, but they're all still feeding the overall, the same business. So my attention and my energy isn't um, really uh, dispersed in different areas, but I'm also able to understand how each thing kind of feeds the, uh, the client's journey and helping them and supporting them at different stages of their journey. Yes, yeah, so, so this kind of raised one of, of, I was thinking as I was listening to all of you, it, something that dawned on me recently, people always come up to me and they'll be like, I'm confused. You know, people, it, what works for me doesn't work for everybody. Sometimes I found that the things that brought me the most joy are the things that weren't bringing in as much money. But I'm finding that my work-life balance, even, you know, I spend a lot of my time volunteering also. Like through many of the stories I've done, I've had relationships built with the Girl Scouts of the Jersey Shore, the Girl Scouts of, uh, of New Jersey, you know, I'm, I'm the YMCA. Like I, I really do find that I identify as an entrepreneur, but I'm not always focusing on the money. I'm, I'm, I really am more focused on what works for me, where I'd like to see myself helping out in my home state. So I think that the definition of entrepreneurship is different to everybody, but I'm now focusing on the things that bring me joy, the things that will provide for my future family, and also, you know, kind of finding my way. I have not figured this all out yet. I'm, you know, like all of you, I'm, I'm kind of watching myself learn every day, discover myself. I do find though that every person I've ever made a connection with, going back to like college, internships, I was involved in the pageants for a bit, Every single resource I've made, I've fostered those relationships. And those are the, oftentimes, the things that bring on those future gigs and they come back in your life for a reason. Well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Provident Bank is an approved lender. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to thank the panelists for coming today. Thank you for all of the information and advice that you shared. I, I think all of us can say that we walked away today with something that we didn't know before. And I will uh, put it back to Stacy to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you.